So although this is the history of rockets, it's really the story of how we launched Yuri Gagarin into space, how we developed the technology to go from literally nothing to propelling him in Vostok 1. So I've broken it down into different segments. So go through the general history of rockets, how we got from um, nothing to developing the technology, then the early rocket launches, then the start of the space race when it started becoming political, and then of course, Yuri Gagarin's launch itself. <clears throat> so I say I've got rocket science, rocket engineer, rocketry science, whatever you want to call it. Um, it started way, way back um, uh, a long time ago. Uh, and one of the first devices to successfully employ the principles of rocket flight was uh, a wooden bird. Um, now, a story of a Greek guy called um, Archeatus. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, the Archeatus pigeon. Uh, and he lived in a city called uh, Tarentum in about 400 BC. Um, and what he did is he mystified and amused people of the uh, uh, the village or city of Tarentum by flying a pigeon made of wood. Uh, and what he did is it used escaping steam that propelled it along suspended wires. Uh, and the pigeon used the action reaction principle, uh, which was not really stated into, um, into scientific law until uh, the 17th century. So this is an animation of the Archeatus pigeon. So there's the pigeon. Uh, he had a little uh, ball on the end that uh, uh, was filled with water, then heat the water. And then, of course, as it started to build up, the steam come along and propelled the pigeon along the wire. So that was really um, the the earliest form of um, rocketry science or rocketry um, uh, uh, principles that we know of. <clears throat> now, about 300 years after the pigeon, there was another Greek guy called um, Hero of Alexandria who did this Hero engine, and he invented a similar rocket device called the Aeopile. Um, now, it too used steam propulsion um, uh, as, a, as a gas to, to, to turn the little uh, cylinder, as you can see on there. So he mounted the sphere on top of a, a kettle. Um, the fire below of the kettle turned the water into steam, and the gas traveled through the little pipes um, on the sphere and the two L-shaped pipes on the opposite sides of the sphere allowed the gas to escape and in doing so gave a thrust to the sphere that caused it to rotate. So again, I've got a little, another little animation of the, uh, the hero's engine here so you can see it in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> so You've got the, uh, the water that was inside there. It heated the water, and then as it went up the steam pipes, it came out and it was able to just propel around in a circle. So again, very simple, but of course, this is the very early stages of uh, rockety engineering. <clears throat> um, the Chinese developed gunpowder around about 100 AD, uh, and that gunpowder was used to create colorful sparks, smokes, explosive devices um, that they all put in uh, hollow bamboo sticks that were closed off at one end uh, and used generally through religious festivals and things like that. Now, they believe that some of these bamboo tubes started firing off and skittering along the ground and off into different directions. Um, so the Chinese started tinkering with these gunpowder filled bamboo sticks uh, and attached them to arrows. And initially, um, these arrows were launched in uh, on traditional bows, creating a form of early incendiary bomb. Um, but later, the Chinese realized that the bamboo sticks could only launch themselves just by the thrust of the hot gas. So they didn't need the um, uh, the arrows. So they started off by firing on the arrows. And then the later ones, they didn't have the arrowheads or anything on them. They could just launch them directly off a little launch shooter there. So they used them as, um, as, as early weapons. <clears throat> and um, developing on from that, uh, according to a Chinese legend, this uh, gentleman here, one who um, he was an official during the 16th century in the Ming Dynasty. And he constructed this chair made of 47 gunpowder bamboo rockets attached in all different forms. Um, and it supposedly fitted uh, the wings of a kite on the top 
so that he should be able to launch himself. Now, the rocket chair was launched by igniting all 47 of these bamboo rockets simultaneously. And apparently, after the commotion was over, Wan Hu was gone. Um, some say that he made it into space and is now the man in the moon, but most likely it suffered the first ever launch pad failure. So that was the first attempt to launch by rockets. Um, bringing them over to Europe then. So the theory is that rockets were brought over to Europe in the 13th century during the Mongol conquests. Um, in England, a guy called Roger Bacon, who you can see there, developed more powerful gunpowder, but increased the range of rockets, while the gentleman on the right, Froussart, he added a launched pad by launching rockets through tubes to improve aiming and accuracy. So, um, yeah, so you, you, you've got a launch pad to be able to launch them in uh, the general direction and point them where you want to go before you send them. But by the Renaissance, the use of rockets were rapidly fell out of fashion and uh, they, that they went back to be uh, increasingly used for fireworks. <clears throat> now, in the late 16th century, a German tinkerer called Johann Schmidlap, um, he experimented with staged rockets and an idea that is the basis of all modern rockets today. He fitted a smaller second stage rocket on the top of a large first stage rocket. And once the first stage burned out, the second stage continued to propel the rocket to higher altitudes. Now, this is an idea that is uh, used as the basis for many rockets today. And you can see a demonstration of it there and um, how it all worked. Now, at the same time, uh, this Polish commander, uh, Simiancevich is uh, who was in the Polish army. He published a manuscript that included a design of multi-stage rockets and delta wings as well um, that were used as stabilizers. So that they replaced the long rods that are currently acting as stabilizers so that you'd be able to fly it uh, again with more accuracy. And the scientific groundwork then was eventually laid out uh, by none other than Sir Isaac Newton with his three laws of motion. So his first, first law explains why rockets move at all, uh, why without creating propulsive thrust, the rocket will remain stationary. The second quantifies the amount of thrust produced by a rocket at a specific instant, i.e. specific mass m. And his third law explains that due to the expulsion of mass in reaction, a thrusting force is produced. Every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So we now have the basis of um, all, the, all the science behind rocket, in, uh, rocket engineering. Uh, and in the 1720s, around the time of Newton's death, um, researchers in the Netherlands, Germany and Russia all started to use his laws as tools to design all different types of rockets. Um, the Dutch professor Wilhelm Gravensand built a rocket propelled car by forcing steam through a nozzle um, and then you could steer it by uh, turning the nozzle in all the different directions you got. So you got some water in here, you'd have a little fire underneath, it would then again propel the steam out the back and you can turn it. How you would stop it, I don't know. I've never seen one in action, but the principle seems quite intriguing. Um, and then the British colonial wars of uh, the late 1790s saw the use of Indian rocket fire against the British Army. Uh, a guy called um, Haider Ali uh, and his son, who were rulers of the Kingdom of Mysore, uh, they developed um, the first iron cased rocket in the 1790s and used them against the British during the Anglo-Mysore Wars. So this is the Mysore rocket here that's got the explosives in the back and it's got a little guide stick on the top um, that it also uses a blade and you'd fire it from a cannon. So it'd be quite accurate because it's got a guide stick but it'd be also be quite deadly because you're firing a blade uh, out of the side of a cannon so it can really do some damage. <clears throat> And then casing the propellant in iron, which is what was done here, which extended the range and thrust, was more advanced technology than anything the British had seen. Uh, and it inspired this guy, um, uh, uh, William Congrave, and he began to design his own rocket for the British forces. Now he developed a new propellant mixture and fitted an iron tube 
with a conical nose to improve its aerodynamics. And his rockets had an operational range of five kilometers uh, and they were successful, su successfully used in the, uh, uh, the British Napoleonic Wars uh, and launched from ships um, in the 1812 wars. So yes, so very, very um, uh, accurate these now. So we're moving on to the, um, the 1800s, uh, the Congrave rockets. Now, at the same time, the effectiveness of rockets was was not their accuracy, but their explosive power. So really, they, they'd be devastating um, when they were uh, when they were fired. Um, the Congrave rockets had managed to overcome some form of accuracy by attaching the large stick in the end, um, but the rockets had the tendency still to veer off course. And in 1844, this gentleman here. William Hale developed spin stabilization, um, which is uh, now commonly used in gun barrels, which removed the need for the rocket stick. So what he did is he forced the escaping exhaust gases at the rear of the rocket um, to impinge through small veins at the bottom, causing the rocket to spin and stabilize. It's the same reason that a gyroscope remains upright when spun on a tabletop. So he's got these little gyroscope bits on the bottom there. So these are all um, examples of early rockets. And if you want to see some of them up close, this is a picture that I took when I went to the Science Museum. And you can see you've got the Hale rocket here, you've got some of the Congrave rockets, and you've got the Mysore rocket here. So you'd be able to see them up close at the, the, the Science Museum. A really good display there. Um, so the use of rockets in war, again, really took a back seat once the invention of the cannon actually took place, because the cannon was a lot more devastating than, uh, the, the, than any rocket was at the time. <clears throat> but development still carried on. And in uh, 1888, this uh, Swedish inventor, Gustav de Lavelle, invented the converging diverging nodule that bears his name today. And it was originally, he designed it for uh, steam turbines. Um, now it's a tube that is pinched in the middle, making an hourglass shape, and it is used as a means of accelerating the flow of the gas that passes through it. So the principle was used in uh, uh, rocket engines by Robert Goddard later on, and um, also the uh, implementation for the uh, the V2 rocket um, as well to give them their distance, which we'll see later on. <clears throat> so now we're really at the turn of the century. And um, at the turn of the century, uh, there was this, uh, anybody who knows anything about rockets has heard of this gentleman, the Russian school teacher, Konstantin Tolyovsky. He proposed the idea of using rockets as a vehicle for space exploration, but acknowledged that the main bottlenecks of achieving such a feat would require significant developments in the range of rockets. And, and the de, de Lavelle nozzle was one of those um, the developments. So he understood that the speed and the range of the rockets was limited by the exhaust velocity in the propellant gases. And in 1903, as part of his report called Research into Interplanetary Space, he suggested that the use of liquid propellants formalized a rocket equation relating to the engine exhaust velocity to the change in velocity of the rocket itself. And this is um, uh, the rocket equation uh, that um, you study when you do um, uh, any uh, um, rocket sign tree. Uh, and it's known as the, 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 the Tolyovsky equation in honor of um, Konstantin Tolyovsky. So, that was how we developed the rocket technology to start actually doing the flights. But then we needed to make things a little bit bigger if we wanted to go to space. Now, I don't think space was the uh, uh, on the cards at this particular time. I think we just wanted to launch something higher, faster, and more accurate. So some of the early rocket science um, uh, from America certainly came from uh, Robert Goddard, who's got the uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center named after himself, um, and he was equally interested in extending the range of rockets, especially reaching higher altitudes than gas balloons could. And in uh, uh, the early 1900s, he published this short manuscript, a method of reaching extreme altitudes, 
and it summarized all the mathematical analysis and practical experiments that he'd done in uh, designing rockets to get up to the high altitude. Um, he proposed three ways of improving this. The first one was um, combustion should be contained to a small chamber, such as uh, a fuel container, um, so it would be subject to much lower pressures. Second, Goddard advocated that the multi-stage rockets needed to be applied, which is something that we'd uh, already uh, seen an example of. And then the third was the use of the de Lavelle nozzle to improve the exhaust speed of the hot gases. So all of the, these things that we've seen up to now, and he was going to combine together to make the ultimate rocket. So he started to experiment with uh, solid fuel rockets, trying various different compounds and measuring the velocity of the exhaust gases. And as a result of his work, he was convinced that Tolyovsky's early premonitions that a liquid propellant rocket would work better. The problem that he faced was the liquid propellant rockets were an entirely new field of research and no one had ever built one up to this point. Uh, and the system required was much more complex than a solid fuel rocket. So such a rocket would need separate tanks and a pump for the fuel and oxidizer, a combustion chamber to combine and ignite the two, and a turbine to drive the pumps, much like the turbine in a jet engine um, that you have. Um, he also added a de Lavelle nozzle, um, and which cooled the hot gas into a hypersonic, highly directed jet that made it increased its efficiency from 2% to 64%. So what we're seeing here is the early stages of uh, the basic rockets that we see today. Despite all of the technical challenges that uh, Goddard had, he designed the first successful liquid filled rocket. Um, it was propelled by a combination of gasoline as a fuel and liquid oxygen as an oxidizer. And in 1926, um, he launched it and tested it. The rocket remained lit for about two and a half seconds and reached an altitude of 12 and a half meters. Doesn't sound a lot, but just like the first flight of the Wright brothers, this feat was really impressive at the time. So he went on to try and do some improvements over the next 40 years. Um, he continued to innovate. His rockets flew higher and higher at higher altitudes. He added gyroscope system for flight control, and he inf even introduced parachutes so that he could recover it all. So Goddard was very influential in the early stages of rockets, hence the, uh, the, the reason why NASA named the Goddard Space Center after him. Now, on the other side of the Atlantic, the Germans were also um, uh, having a go with rockets. Um, and this gentleman, um, Hermann Obarth, um, whose ideas of rocket travel um, was laid down in this practical um, De Arctica Zoom Dem Planet Trurum. My German isn't very good, but it basically translates to the rockets to space. Uh, and a number of rocket societies and research institutes were founded in Germany, and they're all inspired by Hermann Oberth. So what you've really got then is who was the early rocket science? Who was the father of modern rocketry? It's a very, very difficult question to answer because you've got three men, one in America, one in Europe, one in Russia, who were all doing different things, developing all at the same time and coming up with very, very similar results. So I think we have to give it to Tolyoski, Goddard and Oberth because there's no overall winner uh, and, uh, unless you want to debate it after the talk. I'm happy to do so. So we then move on to the war. In Germany, the formation of a rocket society that was um, uh, eventually led to the, uh, the development of the V2 rocket. Um, in 1937, German engineers and scientists, who included Obarth at the time, assembled in uh, uh, Pinamunde on the shores of the Baltic Sea. And there, the most advanced rocket of his time would be built and flown under the direction, direction of Werner von Braun. 
So all of these early rocket um, uh, clubs and societies that they had in Germany, they used all of that technology and um, experience to try and build the rocket for uh, uh, that would hopefully, they planned to get them to win the war. <clears throat> so who was Werner von Braun then? Well, he was born in 1912 and he'd always had visions of going to the moon. And as I say, he joined these rocket clubs when he was younger because they uh, um, all inspired by uh, Oberth. Um, but then Nazi Germany wanted to use those rocket clubs to develop these weapons. Um, and eventually he, he designed the V2 rocket, which was very uh, devastating um, throughout Europe. <clears throat> um, so this is the V2 rocket. So it's very, very small in comparison to um, uh, today's rockets. Uh, it was called the A4 in uh, Germany, um, but we called it the V2. The V stood for vengeance, I understand. Uh, and once launched, the V2 was a really, really formidable weapon, and it could absolutely just destroy whole city blocks in one go. Um, it burned a mixture of alcohol as fuel and liquid oxygen as ox oxidizer, and it achieved great amounts of thrust by considerably improving the mass flow rate um, to 150 kilos per second. Um, the V2 featured much of the technology that we see on rockets today. Um, so it, we were able to uh, use a lot of it to, to, to develop um, moon missions a lot quicker um, than we would have done if the war hadn't taken place, unfortunately. Uh, and due to its range of 190 miles, uh, it could be launched from the shores of the Baltic in Pinamunde, as I said, uh, and bomb London during World War II. <clears throat> so the British didn't believe that they had that technology until one particular day, there was one of the V2s that landed so close to London and did so much devastation that they thought, ah, they are actually 20 to 25 years ahead of the rest of the world with their rockets. We need to do something about this. So they launched what was called Operation Hydra on the night of the 17th stroke 18th of August 1943, and they bombed Pina Munde um, and, and, and devastated it. So it forced the Germans to move inland to a place called Mittelwerk after the UK um, bombed it. Uh, and it was an old abandoned mine. Um, but what it did do is it ramped up production because they had enough room around Mittelwerk to also have uh, a POW camp. And they used the POWs as slaves to effectively free manpower to build all of these V2 rockets. Um, and they just churned them out like a production line. Um, I've seen pictures, I'd want to go there just for the history, but I've seen pictures there and it, 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 they, they've left it as, as much as they can uh, as it was for when they were there, in the, um, when the Germans were there. So if you ever get a chance to go, I would go. Um, now the thing is with the V2 is they would send it up and it would come back down again, but they never really had the full accuracy over that sort of distance. So they relied on spies from German spies inside London to tell them where it landed, and then they could adjust the settings on where it landed or just the, uh, the, the aim and to move it closer and closer to London. But the, the, uh, the British knew who those spies were and ended up getting them or forcing them to give false information to move the bombs away from London so that they could um, uh, do less devastation in more um, rural areas. Um, the ground forces eventually penetrated Germany and did end the war. Um, and with the fall of the Third Reich in April 1945, a lot of the technology fell into the hands of the Allies. The Allies rocket program was uh, much less sophisticated, as you can imagine. Uh, so the race was on to capture as much of the German technology as possible. The Americans alone captured nearly 300 train loads of V2 rocket parts and shipped them back to the United States. And furthermore, 
the most prominent of the German rocket scientists, emigrated to the, uh, the United States, partly due to they'd have much better opportunities of rocket development there, and partly to escape repercussions of having played a role in the Nazi war, um, because they knew that the Americans would be more forgiving to them than the Russians would have been. Um, and the V-2 essentially evolved into the American Redstone rocket, which was used during the uh, the Mercury project. So the Americans rushed as many of the um, German scientists into America as they could under Operation Paperclip. It did have its controversies, but they did go there and they did do the work to eventually um, get America to the moon first. So both the Soviet Union and the United States realised the potential of a rocket um, uh, as a military weapon, not only as a space weapon, and began a variety of experimental programmes. At first, the US began a programme with high altitude sounding rockets, uh, which was one of Goddard's early ideas, uh, and later a variety of medium to long range intercontinental ballistic missiles that were developed. Uh, and these became the starting point of the US space race programme. Missiles such as the Redstone, which you can see on there, the Atlas, the Titan, and they'd all eventually uh, launch astronauts into space. <clears throat> the USSR, though, did manage to obtain some of the V-2 rockets uh, that were abandoned at the Pinamunde site, and they shipped them back to Moscow, but there was no plans, no papers, and it was difficult for, for them to understand. And what's more, they needed someone like von Braun um, who could develop the, uh, the existing technology that was there. <clears throat> so, step forward, this gentleman, Sergei Korolov. Um, he was born in 1907, and he was uh, very heavy into his um, aviation, aeronautics, and plane designs. Um, and um, his plane designs, that made him wonder what was beyond, what was up there in space. So he'd always wanted to... Um, uh, develop something that could go beyond um, the earth. Um, but his designs attracted um, military interest, um, but he was, um, uh, what, what of a better word, he was conned, he was um, uh, set up, um, and he was accused of deliberately slowing work. Uh, and as um, a punishment for that, he was sent to the Gulag for uh, 10 years for manual labor. Um, so they used him because he was a very clever guy and they knew what he was capable of and they released him on the understanding that he would help with the german designs and he did such a good job and became such an important figure that they wanted to keep his identity a secret and he was simply known as the chief designer so, so they didn't want there was a fear of him being assassinated so then nobody was allowed to know who he was <laughs> Um, now, in 1948, the U.S. Army combined a captured V-2 rocket um, with another rocket uh, and launched this uh, bumper WAC, as it was known, uh, over the course of six flights to about 250 miles, which is pretty much where the, uh, the ISS is launched here today. Um, so they were launching rockets fairly early. Uh, and then in the 1950s, they set up the American Rocket Society. Uh, and what they wanted to do is uh, by 1954, uh, they wanted to f uh, send something up as part of the um, national, international geophysical year in 1957. So the idea was they'd send an artificial satellite uh, with a scientific experiment on to orbit the Earth as part of the International Geophysical Year. Now it says 1957 to 1958 for the geophysical year because it ran for 18 months. It started mid-57 and went all the way through um, to 1958. So what were they going to use to launch this? Well, the proposal came from three areas. The first one was the, uh, the United States Army. There was the United States Air Force and then there was the Navy. Now, the Army ballistic missile was under Werner von Braun and had suggested using a modified Redstone rocket called the Juno, uh, the, the Juno 1, which was called the Jupiter C. The Air Force had proposed using an Atlas rocket, which didn't exist at the time, and the Navy proposed designing a rocket system based on the Viking and Aerobee rocket. 
The Air Force proposal wasn't seriously considered as because the Atlas was still in development and, and didn't actually exist at that particular time. Um, and among other limitations, there was the uh, payload issues and um, other things that, um, uh, that was the problem. So the Army one um, focused on a vehicle um whereas a payload was required so the jupiter c was out of that because uh, they definitely wanted to put up a payload so the navy proposal um was then put forward as the one that they wanted to use now in 1955 the uh, the department of defense in america chose the navy's proposal as it appeared the most likely uh, to fulfill putting a satellite into orbit accomplishing a scientific experiment in orbit and tracking the satellite to ensure its attainment of orbit. So they were the three things that it needed to do. And it was designated Project Vanguard, a program that was then placed under Navy management and DOD monitorship. The problem is now that the Army and the Air Force, even though they were uh, still using rockets and developing rockets they weren't allowed to help the navy and they weren't allowed to launch anything into space even if they were, were capable of it the navy was given full access rights which in my opinion was a mistake i think you need to share um uh, information um, and help the navy launch rather than just say no you can't do anything but that's what they did um, so the Navy Research Laboratory was given overall responsibility uh, and the initial one and a half kilo spherical Vanguard satellites were built and they contained all of the payload of seven Mercury cells. Uh, they were in a sealed container. They had two tracking radio transmitters. Uh, they had a temperature uh, sensitive crystal uh, and six clusters of solar cells on the surface to give it its power. Uh, the first satellite was called Vanguard TV3. The TV stood for test vehicle uh, and the original schedule called for the TV3 to be launched during the month of September 1957. So still within the um, uh, uh, geophysical year, but because of lots of delays, this didn't happen. Now, as I said, the Army was forbidden to do any launches, even if they'd developed the capability. Um, and they were even forbidden to pass any data to the Navy um, that they'd found to get involved. Um, they did launch uh, a Jupiter C, but due to these restrictions, it only had a dummy payload of sand as the fourth stage. And Von Braun stated that he could have launched a satellite over 12 months earlier than the Russians if the US had done things right and allowed all of the programs to go ahead and sharing of information. But despite the, uh, the developments, the Soviets were the first, first, first um, uh, nation to put a man-made object into space. Uh, and under the leadership of Korolev, the V2 was copied and then improved upon and the R1, then the R2, the R5. And by the turn of the 1950s, the German designs were abandoned and replaced with the basis of the first Soviet ICBM intercontinental ballistic missile, which is here called the R7. Now, the R7 was further developed into the Vostok rocket, which launched the first satellite Sputnik 1 into orbit on the 4th of October 1957. And that was only a mere 12 years after the end of World War II. Uh, and the launch of Sputnik 1 was the start of what they called the space race. So Khrushchev, who was um, leader of the Russians at the time, ordered Korolev uh, back to work creating a Sputnik 2. Uh, and they wanted it to be ready on the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, which was only a couple of weeks after um, the uh, Sputnik 1, but they managed it. So two weeks after the launch of Sputnik 1, the Soviets successfully launched Sputnik 2 into orbit, which you can see here. And it had a passenger on board called Laika the dog. Uh, and Laika was a stray dog that they picked up on the streets of Moscow. Uh, 
uh, Leica didn't actually come back down, uh, euthanized while in flight, but very famously the, uh, the, the first dog in space. <clears throat> so going back to the Americans then, um, in 1957, so the 6th of December, so uh, they'd already done Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2, so it was the Americans' turn, an attempt was made to launch the TV-3, the test vehicle 3. The Vanguard rocket rose to about four feet, and then the engine lost all thrust and just immediately sank back, sank back down to the, uh, the launch pad and just exploded. And this was live on TV, uh, which wasn't good, um, good uh, PR. Um, the payloads no cone though did detach and landed free of the exploding rocket and the satellite's small radio beacon was still beeping. Uh, the satellite was too damaged to be used uh, on future missions and it now resides at the uh, Air and Space Museum uh, and you can see it there uh, on display. And of course all of the headlines around the world as you can see I've put up there, Kaputnik, Flopnik, all sorts of um, uh, uh, puns that were used um, and an embarrassment to the uh, the Americans at the time. <clears throat> so because of the failure of Vanguard uh, and the success of the Soviet Union Sputnik 2, um, the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, for the American Army wanted to use the Juno 1 and launch a satellite. So von Braun has got his day. So on the 31st of January 1958, the US launched their Explorer 1. It was the first US satellite ever uh, to be launched, and it was the first ever satellite to carry a scientific equipment, and it discovered the Van Allen belts during its process. So they wanted to accelerate the, uh, the, the program of uh, developing more rockets, and on the 1st of October 1958, uh, NASA was formed. Um, they wanted to uh, start a manned space program, so they started looking around for astronauts to be the first man in space. Um, and the Mercury 7 astronauts were announced publicly uh, in April 1959. But the American, uh, the, sorry, the Soviets in the meantime kept going. They had Luna 2, which you can see on the left there, which was the first mission to crash land on the moon. That happened in uh, September 1959. And on the right there, you can see a really fuzzy picture, which came from Luna 3, and it's the first image of the far side of the moon, which was on the 4th of October 1959, which was the second anniversary of Sputnik 1. So the uh, Russians are still ploughing on with firsts. So what about getting man into space then? Well, the first man into space was uh, Yuri Gagarin. Um, he was born in uh, 1934 and he was, um, uh, uh, his parents were farmers uh, and he took an apprenticeship as a foundry man uh, after he'd finished school. He wanted to be an air cadet um, and uh, during his flying he was then drafted into the army uh, and served as a pilot to fly uh, MiG-15s. Now secretly the, uh, the US space program were looking for pilots uh, and they chose about 20 people from all of the different flight schools uh, around Russia. Uh, and when they were chosen, they didn't really know what they were signing up for. It was kind of a, a, a new experimental um, test machine that they were using. Um, so out of all of those 20, uh, Yuri Gagarin and a gentleman called German Titov, who at the moment is still the youngest person ever to have gone into space, uh, they were chosen to make the first flight. And then Yuri Gagarin was chosen by an anonymous vote of uh, the other 19 pilots, and he won by 17 votes to three. And that was only two days before the launch. Uh, and his flight was so secret that in, even his parents didn't even know that he was going into space. Uh, he wrote a letter for his wife and his daughter, and it would only have been delivered in the event of a launch failure. So that's how secret the uh, the Russians were keeping everything. And of course, the Americans were all open and putting everything live on TV. <clears throat> um, one of the things that you probably didn't know that um, uh, he had CCP, CCCP painted on his helmet on the way to the launch site. So um, when he left, to, to get on the bus, there was nothing on his helmet, and then when he arrived, 
they'd literally painted it on when they got there and the reason why is because if the eventually in the event he did land anywhere outside of um, russia they didn't want him to be mistaken as a spy so then if he's got russian clothing on then or, or russian insignia um they know that he's russian and not dressed up in clothing and uh, pretending to be somebody who is not uh, and then when he got to the launch site he got off the bus and he needed to have a wee so he went round to the back wheel he weed up the back wheel uh, before he climbed the uh, launch tower and that tradition is still now followed um, by later soviet astronauts who also went and weed up the back wheel before they got onto the uh, um, uh, launch pad and uh, into the rocket so on the 12th of april 1961 very famous date uh, around about 9 a.m moscow time vostok one blasted off from the soviet's launch site um because no one really knew uh, how weightlessness would affect a pilot the spherical capsule had little in the way of onboard controls so the work was all done either automatically or, or from the ground so he just he was literally a glorified passenger uh, if an emergency did arise, though, Gagarin was supposed to receive an override code that would allow him to make manual control available. Uh, but Sergei Korolov had given him that code uh, and broken protocol and given it to him before he'd um, lifted off. So he did have a way of um, saving himself if he needed to. Mm. Um, over the course of his uh, 108 minute flight, he traveled around the Earth once. And he got to an altitude of about just over 200 miles uh, and what he did during that time is um, uh, he described his view and the feeling of weightlessness and there's actually a film that they made about it uh, i think it's called orbit where you can watch it and it's actually um, uh, international space station footage of going around the earth but they've overlaid the um, flight commentary of Yuri Gagarin's flight so you can hear what he said during his 108 minutes so it's, it's really interesting there's a lot of nothingness at some point but it, it's really good to watch even if you just see it the once um, the spacecraft did carry 10 days worth of um, provisions on board just in case the engines failed and Gagarin had to wait for um, a natural decay in orbit to come back down again um, but the supplies were unnecessary he re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, um, but when um, his uh, uh, the bottom of his capsule went to release, the cables actually got caught. But luckily, um, as he came in, the Earth's atmosphere, the heat from the Earth's atmosphere, heated up the cables, burnt through the cables, um, and able to release the um, uh, the bottom part, allowing his heat shield to take the brunt of the the rest of it um now vostok one didn't have any engines so it's a slow re-entry and it had no way of doing a um soft landing so about four or five miles up gagarin ejected from the spacecraft and parachuted back down to the earth now really in order for a mission to be counted as an official space flight according to the fai who's the um the international board at the time that was doing the space flights um he had to land while in his capsule but the soviets indicated that the gagarin had touched down inside vostok one and they didn't reveal that he ejected until 1971 so yes over 10 years later um Anyway, regardless, he still sets the record for the first person to leave Earth orbit and travel um, into space and do an orbit. He became a national hero as a result, travelled the world, including a five day visit to London during uh, July 1961. But on the 27th of March 1968, um, Gagarin had died together with pilot um, Vladimir Suryogin during a routine training flight after his MiG-15 jet fighter uh, crashed um, uh, in the Soviet Union. And as a, a commemorative um, added value, NASA's Apollo 11 astronauts left behind a commemorative medallion 
bearing Gagarin's name, which is one of the things I mentioned during my NASA Dust Nostalgia in my last um, uh, presentation. So if you wanted to hear more about that, you can go back and listen to that on uh, the OU Space YouTube channel. So that is it. 12th of April then. This is the story of where we've gone from uh, developing rocket technology to getting the first man into orbit or the first person into orbit. Um, and uh, April the 12th is now known as the International Day of Human Spaceflight. And incidentally, that's when I'll be next doing my talk for the OU um, because it shares the date with the launch of the first space shuttle. So I'll, as part of International Day of Human Spaceflight, I'll be called talking to you about um, the story and the history of the space shuttle program. <laughs>